In this lecture, we're going to talk about basic functions, common Excel errors, and cell addressing. Many times when you're working in an Excel spreadsheet, you may see these errors. You may see unusual symbols. For example, you see pound signs in column E. These symbols, when they're displayed like this, just mean that the cell is not big enough to fit the contents. So you just have to make the cell bigger, wider. You can do that just by dragging the cell up there between D and E, or you can just double click between the D and E column at heading at the top. Sometimes you will see a green triangle. The green triangle is an error message from Excel saying you have an inconsistent formula or you have an inconsistent value in that cell. If you put your mouse and hover it, hover it around that green triangle, you click on the cell, hover it around that green triangle, it will come up with an exclamation point. The exclamation point will have an error, excuse me, an arrow to the right of it. You click on that arrow and then you will receive a context sensitive menu that tells you the errors or the error that Excel thinks is in that cell. If you wish to correct that error, you can correct it or you can ignore the error. Here it says number stored as text. Well, in order for us to do any kind of mathematical equations or functions using this cell reference, it needs to be stored as a number. So Excel recognizes it as a number. So you would just click on the convert to number option. Many times an error that Excel gives you is probably not one that's truly an error. So what you would do is just click on it and click on ignore error. If you have a group of triangles, you can just highlight all of the cells that have a triangle in them, go up to the top cell, hover your mouse around the green triangle, and then click on ignore error or whatever you want to do there, and it will delete all those triangles. You do not want those green triangles showing up in your spreadsheet. It doesn't look good, and it may alarm your manager or the people that are looking at it thinking you did not um, design this correctly or there truly is a problem. Here's another error that you may encounter. If you look in column B on the left hand side of your screen, you'll see that we're adding, we well actually we have values for these bonus points, 40,000 um, and 26 cents, 40,000 and 23 cents, etc. The last cell says 160,059 cents. In that cell, we're actually doing a sum function. But if you look in the middle of the screen, if you truly add those values up as you see them, it should come up to 160,060 cents. So you may think to yourself, Excel has an error. And there are some bugs, we call bugs errors, in Excel, but normally it's user error. In this case, if you look at the right side of the screen with column B, it shows you that these um, values are actually have three decimal places, some of them do. So when you add those up, it should come out to 160,000.593. So if you notice what's happening in the very left side with the 160,059, Excel is truncating the 3. What do I mean by truncating? It's just not displaying that 3. Okay, now it still has the value 160,000.593. It's storing that value in that cell, but it's just not displaying it. So there is a difference between precision and formatting. You can format a cell any way you want to. You can format it with zero decimal places, two, etc. But that does not change the contents of the cell. So if you're working in an accounting department, or any department for that matter, that, uh, is very, that numbers or values are very important, you could really cause problems if it, if it gives you the illusion 
that your numbers are adding up correctly or incorrectly, and they're not either way. So you can go and format, but to be precise, you need to use a function called the round function, and we will talk about that. The round function truly rounds that number to the value that you want, two decimal places, one decimal place, etc. How do you know what to round it to? It's your boss will tell you, your manager will tell you. In this case, for this class, I will tell you. Okay, now let's just talk about basic functions. How does a function work? Well, a function will take arguments and return a result. A function is basically, it uses something called an algorithm. And what is an algorithm? A step-by-step -step procedure for accomplishing some end a task. And the result is the value calculated by that function. Basically, a function is a small program that was written by Microsoft programmers that when you type in the function and you put in arguments for that function, it will return a value. It will run the program and it will return the value and display that value in your Excel spreadsheet. So you don't have to do the work. The function does it for you. Because these functions or little programs are written by Microsoft programmers, we have to follow the rules set up for that function in order for that function to work correctly. The rules or the grammar of the function is called the syntax. The syntax is not case sensitive. The format or syntax of a basic function, you always put the equal sign, you put the function name with no spaces, and then you have arguments that you will put in parentheses. The arguments or variables or values that the function uses to calculate the result. Let's look at an example. Here we have the sum function, and many of you have used the sum function, and you are familiar with it. Here is the syntax. If you went to Excel and you looked at the help screen, this is exactly the syntax it would show you. Equals sum, left parenthesis, number one, comma, in brackets, number two, comma, dot, 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 right parenthesis. They name their arguments to try to make them self-describing, so that's why you'll see number one, comma, number two. Um, but let's, let's go through this and diagram it. Okay, if the function, if the argument does not have a bracket around it, that means it's a required argument. Any other argument, if it has brackets around it, that means it's optional. If you see a dot, 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 which is an ellipsis, and actually I have four dots here, but it should be three, if you see dot, 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 ellipsis, that means you can have many more arguments. This function is called a, a function with range arguments, or a range function, because the arguments do not have to be in a specific order. Many of the functions that we're going to learn in this class, the arguments have to be in a specific order, in order for the function to work correctly. No function should ever end with a comma. So make sure that you never end your function with a comma before the parentheses. Now let's take a look at the syntax of a basic sum function. I have a1 colon a4. That just sums the range a1 all the way to a4. And again, it's a program that's doing that for you. Comma separates the argument. a1 to d4. This time I'm adding a two-dimensional range. Then I'm adding cell A1. So it's adding all the contents of A1 to A4, comma A1 to D4, and now it's going to add those values to A1. Okay, now I'm doing another range, D3 colon D5. Then I'm adding 7 to all of these, and then I'm adding something called markup. Well, what is markup? Markup is called a named range. You can actually name a cell, and when you name the cell, you can use the name that you gave it, or you can use that cell reference. Um, in this case, I'm using the name. I called it markup. Um, so I have my right parenthesis, which ends my argument list, and then it will sum all those values, and then it will multiply those by 3.
Here are some common functions that you will learn from your labs. Uh, we will not go over these functions. You should look at these and understand what they do. I am going to go over, though, the count and the count A function. The count function determines the number of cells in a range that contain numbers. So you'll give it a range, you'll, you'll put a range in for the argument, and then it will come back and give you a value. If only two of the cells in that range have a number, it will display the number two. The count function you can only use with numbers. If you want to count any cell that's non-blank in your range, then you need to use the count a function. So if you're counting anything that is just numeric, you can use count. But if you want to count something that's numeric and non-numeric, you, you want to use a count a. Again, it counts the number of cells that are either, well, and for the count a, for example, that are non-blank. Okay, I talked to you a little bit about the round function, and let's go over the syntax. Equals round, number, comma, num of digits. The number argument is the actual number to be rounded. It can be a cell reference, it can be a number, or it can actually be a function. So you can have a function within a function. The num digits is basically the number of decimal places you would like to round this to. And again, the num digits, we just have to put this in. This is the rule. This is how the programmer said, or put this in saying, okay, if you don't put it in this order and you don't put it like I want it, then the program will not work correctly and you'll receive an error message instead of a value. Okay, the rules that this programmer made was that the num of digits, if, it's, if you put a zero in that argument, it's going to round it to the nearest whole number. If you put a one, it will round the number to the nearest tenth. If you put a two, it will round the number to the nearest hundredth. If you put a negative 1, it will round it to the nearest tens. A negative 2, the nearest hundreds. And it goes down the line. Negative 3, negative 4, or 0, 1, 2, 3, 4. Here's another example. Okay, so here I just have the sum function up there in column C. And the answer is 85.010. So I'm adding the values in column A, and I just did a basic sum. Now I'm summing and rounding to the nearest tenth. If you look down in columns and cell C2, it says 85 at the top. If you look lower down on the bottom of the screen, it shows you the actual function equals round sum A2 colon A4 comma 1. I'm rounding this to the nearest tenth and you can see how it displays. In C3, I'm averaging rounding it to the nearest tenth. So I'm typing in equals round average A2 colon A4 comma 1. So I'm averaging those cells in columns A2 to A4 and I'm rounding that average to the nearest tenth. And here in cell C4, I'm actually averaging the cells, and I'm rounding them to the nearest tens. You can type in functions yourself, or you can use something called the function wizard. Your book will show you how to use the function wizard. You can do whatever you want, but remember in your exams, you will not have the function wizard, and you will have to type in the cells, or the, excuse me, the arguments yourself, along with the syntax of the function. Um, so you want to learn how to type these in. Okay. Now, let's take a look at this. In column A, actually let's look down to um, column B. In column B, we have a quantity of 25 in cell B2. In cell B3, we have a quantity of 0. When we type in the average function in cell B4, the answer is 12.5. When we type in the average, uh, excuse me, the minimum function in cell B, excuse me, B5, we get the answer 0. Okay, let's look at columns D and E. This time we have the quantity 25, the same 
that we had before, but we have a blank cell in E3. When you calculate the average in cell E4, the average is 25. When you calculate the minimum in E5, the answer is 25. What I want to point out to you here is that blank cells are ignored. They're just not counted. So which one is right? Well, it just depends on what you want to do with the average and minimum. If you, anything that's blank, if you really don't want to average that or count that in the minimum function, then you're okay. But if you'd like to count that, for example, if I am averaging grades, if you don't turn something in, I want it to be averaged in your grade, so I would put a zero. But I wanted to point out to you what happens when you use blank cells in some of these functions. Here's another example. I want to insert a row between rows 2 and 3. And I want to add an order number, 301, and the quantity of 1,000. In cell B4 at the top, I have equal sum B2 colon B3. In cell E4 at the top, I have equals E2 plus E3. In the bottom, I've actually inserted that row and added the value. But you notice, in cell B5, it's equal sum B2 colon B4. So the function has automatically changed the argument to insert that extra row or that value in that row. But if you look over here, when I use E2 plus E3 at the top, when I insert the row, it does not insert the E3. It just says equals E2 plus E4. That's why you want to use functions, because the arguments will adjust if you insert rows or columns. One thing I want to point out, though, is if you are inserting, let's go back up to the top left-hand side, and let's say you wanted to insert a row between 3 and 4. Excel does not have the capability to realize that cell, that row 4 that you're inserting between there, uh, is actually a value you want to add. So it would not change the B2 colon B3 to B2 colon B4. So what that means is you should always insert a row between your values. Don't insert a row at the end of the value list unless you want to go and change the function manually. And you could do that. You could go and change some B2 colon B3 and just type in change the 3 to a 4. Here are some common Excel error messages. I'm not going to go over these with you. Here's just a list. There's also a list, the same list in your book. Uh, just to be aware, if you get some kind of error like this, um, then you need to kind of follow uh, what it says and, and try to fix it. Okay, now we're going to start into something different. Let's say that I have at the bottom here, I have payments, charges, and amount due. In cell B6, I have the function equals sum B2 colon B5. And then I copy that function over to cell C6 and cell D6. If you notice when I copy it to cell C6, it changes the arguments from B2 colon B5 to C2 colon C5. And when I copy it over to column D or to cell D6, it changes the cell reference or the arguments to D2 colon D5. This is called relative cell referencing or addressing. Meaning, Excel thinks that when you copy a formula, it will copy the cell references in the formula or the arguments relative to where you copy it from. So I'm copying, if in B6, I'm copying this function over one column. So it changes the arguments in my function, adds one column to the arguments. This is the type of cell addressing or referencing that most of you are used to. Let's take a look at this. Here I have a basic spreadsheet that is a travel reimbursement for my mileage. I go to different campuses. And I've put down the number of my trips. So at Newark in January, I made one trip. In February, I made five. And in March, I made four. 
If you notice in cell D4, it tells me that I will be reimbursed $125 every time I make a trip to Newark. And I will be reimbursed $175 every time I make a trip to the Marion campus. So I have number of trips in row 6 and then my reimbursement. Let's go to the right side. In cell D8, I'm typing in equals D dollar sign 4 times B8. Look at the spreadsheet design. All I have to do is type my formula in one spot, copy it over to E8 and down to E10. So I don't have to type in six different formulas. Well, how do I make sure that these, that these cell references don't change? Well, look at this. D4 times B8 in cell D8. When I copy this over, I don't want it to change. Excuse me. Yes, I do. When I copy it over, I want it to change to E. And it does. But when I go back to cell D8 and I copy it down, I do not want the 4 to change because all of these months I'm going to be reimbursed for the Newark dollar amount. So how do I keep that cell reference, that row, as a 4? I put a dollar sign in front of it. That is called a mixed cell address. So I go back to the original cell, I put a dollar sign in that row, fill handle it over and down, and when I say fill handle, I mean copy because fill handle is what they call it in Excel. And there I have my values. Notice nothing's hard coded. Everything uses a cell reference and I have this set up properly. So I only type in one formula, copy over and copy down. Okay, here's another example. Um, I travel to different places, and here I'm, tra I travel to, I'm traveling to Miami, Los Angeles, and Phoenix. And I want to get reimbursed. Well, I have the base trip price of the round trip airfare and the lodging, and then I have a price with the service charge. Well, the travel agent is going to charge a 5% rate. So in cells D6 all the way to E8, I want the cost with the travel service charge. We'll go to the right and let's look at this other spreadsheet. In cell D6, I have equals B6 times dollar sign C, dollar sign 2, plus B6. I have a, uh, excuse me, I have a dollar sign in front of the C and a dollar sign in front of the 2. What that means is it doesn't matter where I copy that formula, that cell reference C2 will always stay the same. And that's what I want because I always want this whether it's round trip, airfare, or lodging, or it's down to my different cities that I'm traveling to. I want that service charge to stay at 5%. Now, when you do this, only use the dollar signs that are needed. Okay? Some people try to dollar sign things all over the place in these references, and, and it may work, but it's redundant, it's extraneous. So we will count off points when you put extra dollar signs. When you read your books and you look at them, they always put absolute cell references, and that's fine when you get out in the business world and start working with this. But I want to know that you know how to use these cell references, how to use these dollar signs. So I'm going to count off a half point to a point for every time you have a redundant or needless dollar sign. All right, let's talk about hard coding values, and we've already mentioned this before. But let's take a look at this. So down here I have the same spreadsheet, but instead of using a cell reference, I'm using .05 in the formula. Can you see the problem? Number one, if I change that service charge to 6%, I'm going to have to go to formula view, and I'm going to have to find out everywhere I use that 6%, or that 5% so I could change it to 6. This is an easy spreadsheet. It's a small spreadsheet. In the business world, you are going to have big spreadsheets, massive spreadsheets, and it would be very, very, very time consuming to go check all of this. 
actually I think I was talking about changing it to 8% and I said 6% but you understand the idea also my boss or my manager can actually look in row 2 and find out that the service charge for that travel agent was 5% if I need to change it he can see the change so it's very easy for people to read it and it's easy to change the formulas if you need to we talked about naming cells and when you name a cell when you give it a name and it's called a named range because you can give one cell a name or you can give a group of cells a name when you do that it treats that name as an absolute cell reference so if you look down here in D6 I said equals B6 times service charge plus B6 that service charge name is referencing cell C2 it's, cre um, it's acknowledging that or treating that as an absolute cell reference so if I copied it over and down the cell reference wouldn't change and then over in cell E6 I have the dollar sign C dollar sign 2 just to show you that either one would work correctly okay but you could type in cell the values that I have in cell D6 in the formula and then just fill handle it over and down and it would be fine in your book you will learn how to name a cell or a range of cells so let's do some examples here I'm in formula view and in cell A1 I type in equals H4 plus L4 okay and you see when I copy it over and down or fill handle it there are your cell references now I want you to fill in the grid after you fill in the grid we'll go over it in class and then fill in this grid and we will go over this one in class as well and finally fill in this grid